My name is Kyle Bergman. I'm festival director for the Architecture and Design Film Festival. And um, glad you guys got a chance to see the film in Cairo. It's uh, super exciting to be showing it. And we have here with us on a Zoom Q&A, uh, Liz Diller, architect Liz Diller, who you just met in the film, and um, filmmaker Tom Piper, who you didn't meet in the film, but you saw his work throughout the whole thing. So thank you guys both for joining us. Uh, really appreciate you taking some time uh, this morning. We're all actually here in New York, and uh, it's a beautiful fall morning, and we're recording this in November. Thank mm -hmm. Thanks, Liz. Thanks, Tom. Um, thank you. So I'll just start off a little bit. So the film is, it was made 10 years ago. I mean, even though it came out in 2012, it was filmed 2011 and 10. And, um, you know, looking back, you guys were thinking about uh, reimagining the High Line and reimagining Lincoln Center. So talk about a little bit about how um, that film, um, what it did to help you think about phase two and phase three uh, of, of the High Line, because then it was a chance to see what you did in phase one and look at phase two and phase three. So Liz, maybe I'll start with you there. Yeah, that was a moment in time when we were right in the middle of everything. And it was hard to get any kind of objective sense of what we were doing just in the thick of, um, of the work itself. So I remember um, in making the film, it felt like a terrible distraction because we're just trying to get the film done. But at the same time, um, it, was, it was nice to momentarily just step away and uh, speak about what we were doing and understand actually the importance and gravity and, and uh, the seriousness of the work that was being done and, and how many people it would affect and, and so forth. So then, you know, so many years later with the completion of the projects and seeing how all of it is used. And now also seeing the film, there's this really nice closure that we have well, with the public now having experienced the spaces, having seen the film and uh, yeah, it's just, it's another manifestation. The film is another manifestation of these projects. Yeah. And Tom, for you as uh, making a film, tell us how you got involved with like talking to Liz and Rick and, and Charles and, and, and putting these two projects together into one film. Um, yeah, I mean, it was, I, the, the actual genesis is that this was part of a, a kind of ongoing series. It was actually the sort of last installment from a series that was, uh, we received a grant from the Peter J. Sharp Foundation that, the checkerboard films received this grant and and the idea was we were going to produce a series of shorter films and each film would be about one building from a, a prominent architect and so we had made i think nine of these up to this point and um and we've been working with um suzanne stevens who's the uh editor at architectural record magazine and um and she was kind of our our you know the um the 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 organizer and the, and behind the scenes of deciding which projects were going to be the ones that would stand up to the test of time and 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 but at some point it be the interest in wanting to do something with Diller Scafidio and Renfro was you know that that it seemed like this would be a really exciting um, subject but then there wasn't there was a lot of indecision about which project which building how to actually look into it and. And then I think it, it just started to feel like the two projects, Lincoln Center and the High Line, were, you know, they were they were both kind of in this idea of the, what we ended up sort of calling reimagining, but, uh, you know, it's sort of this adaptive reuse that's now very in vogue or something, you know, just sort of an intervention into an existing architectural, <clears throat> and it seemed like, oh, it would be a really interesting way to, to enter into those projects in a kind of different way of making architecture from instead of just a single building that would stand alone um and then also it just felt like that 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 it it lent itself to becoming a larger it wasn't you know 20 minutes didn't feel sufficient and so it became a sort of of the series it was the first hour-long film that we made um and so it, it was a, a chance to really get into the history of the of their work and understand how it had arrived to that point. And then of course, seeing it from here on has been the most exciting thing. Right. Well, well, Tom, Tom, I, can I, I, I want to say one thing because Tom, what, um, you know, it, it makes me remember um, 
this, these two projects were totally coincidental. They happened more or less, they started within the same year and they lasted forever, both of them, at least a decade and, and more. Um, we're still not quite finished with the highlight. It just keeps going and going. But um, what was happening with us is that both of them were totally career changing projects. The first projects that we did at any scale in New York, really of scale public projects, they were, um, uh, they, the, each of them matured our studio tremendously. And the fact that they were happening in parallel, our studio quadrupled in size, you know, and, um, and it, it, both huge responsibilities. I think at the time we weren't able to objectively see how proximate they were. You know, they were just not that many blocks apart um, on the West side. Um, you know, immensely, um, that they were going to be immensely uh, popular and influential in a way. We had no clue that that would happen. They, they both started small and, they, and then they grew and grew and grew. So I think it, when you made the film, it was, you know, we're already sort of in the middle of everything, but we still didn't have the objectivity to understand, um, you know, that these were sister projects almost. Um, and they reflected everything about our, the way we thought about the city, the way we um, sort of grew into architecture away from, let's say, not away from, but in parallel to all of our other activities that we, that we did also in public space, but never at the scale and with a sort of gravitas of these two projects. Yeah, I, I mean, okay. very, it feels very, I mean, that's always sort of, the nicest moment in making any documentary is like you get these sort of serendipitous coincidental as you say like moments that that you, you can't script or predict but you just kind of hope will emerge and and i think the way in which it felt you know in the moment it felt very much like oh this is a the, the cusp or turning you know some kind of uh, juncture but it was impossible to know what that meant i mean it did mean there were lots of really great conversations where you know <laughs> Rick in particular would talk about, you know, like his idea of like staying small or this, you know, this fantasy of having just a few architects or something. And it was clear like that was <laughs> that station uh, already, you know, and um, so it's amazing to sort of look back on it and realize like what, what, what it's become and where you've gone since then. Yeah, no. yeah. That, that pivotal moment is so interesting. I mean, I mean it was clear for Phyllis Crittle and Renfro that that was really you know, a trend, a moment of transition because you go on to do all these major public works after. And even for Tom, you end up doing a lot more films after that in a, in a different level and, up, and it launches you. So they, you have Pete Aldorf who's in the film uh, and so important to the project. And then Tom later does a beautiful film on um, um, Pete, you know, so mm -hmm. it was kind of like, it launched kind of both you guys different ways in different directions. So it's, it's it was amazing to rewatch and see it. So, so Liz, talk about, because it really, like, it was nice the three of you are in the office and it seems so casual, you know, and I know now the office is still casual, but it, there's a lot more going on. It's, <laughs> you, know, <Yes. laughs> um, you know, look, I mean, how does it feel now that now you guys are doing a lot more public projects and we have the this, this shed and so many public projects. What is that like now, you know, as you guys have grown into a worldwide uh, firm. Yeah, I, you know, following those we did, we were so fortunate to um, have even more projects in New York between uh, Museum of Modern Art expansion, which also was a big complex project. Um, and of course the shed, which, which uh, started in 2008 and, uh, and opened in 2019, um, you know, a very, very long, projects that um, involved uh, us as, as architects, but also as co-creators of this new institution, really without a client. Um, and, uh, and, and other projects, the three buildings for Columbia University, um, many exhibitions and so forth. And I, I realized that, um, you know, in, in a sense, we had become the local architects in New York, even though these were international and major projects. Um, we had 
had the opportunity to do major projects in our own city, um, which very, very rarely happens with, with architects. Usually they start someplace else and they get brought in, uh, you know, at the end of their career, um, you know, um, sometimes, you know, just um, out of courtesy or pity or something. We, we had, <laughs> we had the, this, this incredible opportunity to change our city and to, to make meaningful contributions here. So, you know, I sometimes feel, oh my God, did we just use it up? You know, do we, right now we're doing lots of work in different parts of the world. Um, so we just finished, uh, we're just in, uh, uh, finishing two projects in China. We're doing, we're starting a project in Adelaide. Um, we are, have two uh, projects in Milan and one in uh, London and one in Paris. Uh, and one in uh, Budapest um, and more. And these are, it, it somehow our work has uh, just grown bigger and bigger and, um, and, and more of different types of projects. Um, and the studio has increased from, there was once the two of us, Rick and I out of our loft to 12, to 24, to 60, then to 120. And, and that's pretty much where we are now. Uh, no interest in getting, um, in, in getting larger. But um, what dawned on me uh, was that you know, this was not sort of a, a hiccup in our career, those early projects. It is uh, really in essence, the, the ambition of our studio is to make contributions to cities. We really, Cities are a project, um, and maybe you know, as we think uh, beyond um, international um, boundaries, you know, and and look at the globe as a thing, uh, you know, and think about all sorts of issues about uh, uh, you know um, the health of the planet and and uh, you know this kind of strange politics, you know, all over the world. We we see things in a different way, and we see cities as potentially very, very strong components that bring um, the globe together and any contributions we can make to uh, a city. Where, I didn't mention Madrid, you know, another one. And very often we're working on projects of um, the 60s, uh, 50s and 60s that went wrong, urbanistic mm -hmm. projects, you know, like Lincoln Center mm -hmm. that, um, you know, were seen uh, through the eyes of, uh, you know, sort of modernists at a certain time that um, had a very different view of what the public was and very different view of uh, automobiles and, and uh, suburbia uh, and urban culture. And now coming back with a different sense of sen uh, set of sensibilities, trying to um, kind of course correct or at least, uh, you know, represent, um, you know, contemporary uh, ob objectives and aspirations. Right. and not give up on cities and not abandon places, but really work through and, um, you know, and add and contribute and bring them up to, you know, a different so, level. So, so this idea of course correct or reimagining is kind of interesting because as, as your firm, what is the differences when, it, or are there any differences when you're rethinking the High Line and Lincoln Center, or if you're starting a project from, from scratch where you have more of a, um, uh, less restraint, less constraints on you. Do you guys think about it differently or is it really the same process? Um, I think it's very much the same process because we never think of ourselves um, as the first at the table. You know, we come to a place or a situation trying to understand who was there before us, you know, um, and, and we're thinking about histories of place, histories of program, our own situation in whatever, you know, discussion there is today that's meaningful to us um, and, um, and, and trying to figure out, you know, what there is to say today and whether it's on an existing structure and how it might um, be adjusted or rethought or what, you know, what was wrong that really needs to be entirely rethought or what needs to be uh, tweaked, you know, I mean, it, it, there's a whole variety of different kinds of actions that an architect Mm -hmm. can have. Um, sometimes even just renaming something is, is enough, 
you know, um, so we're always looking for the sort of the volume of the architectural voice. It doesn't always have to be loud. It doesn't always have to be high testosterone. It could be soft. Um, um, on the other hand, you know, the, the opportunity to make something anew, it usually comes from the, the sense that ha something has to be done and nobody else is doing anything about this. Mm -hmm. So do it, you know, and I mean, that was the, that was the case with, with the shed. It was, um, in New York was being emptied out of all production. It was all consumption. You know, we wanted to, you know, reserve a place that was being taken over by developers, um, greedy developers and, um, and, and preserve a place for the public and preserve a place for artists to um, communicate um, to the public. And so it felt like something that needed to be done. It's just a question of how and what are uh, the new generative um, uh, ideas um, uh, without taking, you know, the leftovers or the leave behinds of, you know, of, of, of other uh, efforts. However, um, but collecting as much information as we can, you know, like uh, it's, it's, there's a fair amount of research analysis um, and consideration about the critique um, and, and where something can go into the next step. So all of our projects have that. A lot of people get very successful and they stop challenging themselves. And um, it's, 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 you know, it's courageous it's, it's, to do that. Yeah, it's not fun if you don't, you know, if, if failure isn't a possibility, right? So, uh, you know, it just, um, you, you know, what I what I loved about, you know, that project and and kind of, you know, the sort of trajectory of our career is is that, um, you know, that it, it's driven by curiosity and learning, you know, because with each project we learn something that we didn't know before, like, um, and 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 that's what pro provokes, um, I think, original work, because you're, you're really sort of pushing yourself, you're learning as much as you can, you don't feel like you know everything. Right. Um, right. And, uh, and, and you put yourself out there. And, and so I think, you know, while some people say the best times of their lives are in their, you know, in their late teens or 20s, because they're doing things for the first time, I think that you should go on through life always sort of stepping off the cliff. Stepping <laughs> off the cliff is good. It keeps, it keeps you young and, and, yeah. and, and energized. So Tom, what ta so I wanna bring it back to you a little bit. What are you challenging yourself with now? Any uh, new projects or new films that are kind of uh, coming about that we should know about? Sure, yeah, I, d I wanted to just add one thing because I, I think, I mean, Kyle and I were actually talking about this before we started the conversation and we were talking, remembering the mile long opera and because I, <clears throat> I was saying that was actually the last time I think you and I ran into each other in person, Liz. And, and yeah. so like that reminded me that there's there was this social aspect to it as well. Um, but just in, in general, the, like the generosity of, of the whole effort and, and that it was, um, you know, so is, 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 is all that work is not just about creating this artwork, but it's about giving the artwork and, and sharing it. And I, I think that's something that, you know, throughout your, your work in general, but certainly between the High Line and, and Lincoln Center, um, in overt ways, but in maybe with Lincoln Center in much more subtle ways, there's like, there's an act of generosity, even thinking about this idea of course correction in a city that, that you feel like you can actually give to a city this chance to correct a mistake or, or shift the direction of how cities are, are evolving. Um, I mean, I think that's an incredible component that that you, we, we sort of continue to benefit from as uh, you know, people who get to participate in the work. But I think there are certain efforts that really strike that note and, and the, the opera, I mean, the high line yeah. in, in creating the space, but then the opera is a real incredible example of that. Um, Thank you, Tom. I, I, that means a lot to me because, you know, I, uh, for um, a lot of my life before architecture came into it, I didn't really understand, understand um, how I could connect with, um, with meaningful change. You know, I, the work was somewhat autonomous, you know, it was seen by a small subculture. Um, and it, it didn't dawn on me until those public projects that is possible to uh, produce change that actually mattered to people. And it didn't matter, you know, in the end uh, that it was anonymous. You know, I, 
people that go to Lincoln Center never have heard of us, you know, and it's, it's, it's not discussed as if, you know, like, a, like you know, a, a building that has like a unique identity, you know, like a Frank Gehry kind of building that's all about signature. It, this is about sort of almost being anonymous in the background, but making a change that some people don't realize was this always this way. And I think that that kind of, um, uh, you know, um, that kind of uh, effect, I think, is, 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 is something very important to me where I as a citizen can come back and actually enjoy it and almost, you know, um, separate myself from the punch list that has never been completed, which is still <laughs> annoys me sometimes, but to actually sort of lose myself in some of these places as, um, as, as a citizen. Uh, it, it makes it makes a difference. So thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's a continuous process. I mean, I think you know, as you talk about with the the High Line, I mean, it, it's it's the desire to recreate that is also driven by cities with an economic incentive or or, or neighborhood, you know, what, that shifts from recovery to gentrification to to sort of developmental exploitation or something. Yeah, like that. yeah you're always coming back to this idea of trying to insist that it can also you know i think even the shed is an example of that where obviously that that whole development i mean it is smack dab in the middle of a very controversial development in terms of what, what it means mm. for the city and the future of the city but to, you know the there's still an insistence on trying to add an element or or recover or or maintain an element that is that is public and generous mm. and uh, yeah and and the shed is the anchor to the rest of the city. Without that, it's an island that yeah. could be really separate. I mean, it is separate in a lot of ways, but the shed allows it to, and the high line that going through there, allows it to be, uh, continue to be um, uh, connected to the city. And hopefully in the future, it becomes more connected rather, you know, and I think, you know, the opportunity of having the shed there uh, makes that more possible, I think. I think you know this this city in its wisdom when they um, put that enormous site of Hudson Yards up for um, sale, basically to the to the highest bidder, um, it it reserved a certain portion of space, not not very large, but on which um, uh, the, the culture shed is, uh, or the shed used to be called the culture shed, but the shed is is sited and. And um, they felt that um, as the city grew, so too should culture and other institutions. So they, in their wisdom at that point, just said, okay, this part belongs to the city. It will be on a, you know, uh, basically on a 100 year lease to some institution. And this institution sort of came about because of the opportunity to be there and to do something um, that isn't just an expansion of existing institution. It's what does New York need that it does not have. And, um, you know, some, some people, you know, just uh, think that somehow the shed is part of Hudson Yards. No, it is exactly the resistance to Hudson Yards. It's being opportunistic and taking a site that was offered by the city to bring something that was, you know, like that 1% it's our perspective of Hudson Yards is, is for that one. This is a place that welcomes everyone, that produces programming, that gives you know, a, a tremendous amount of opportunity to artists that are, are not established, um, um, that gives a, a $10 seats to you know, anyone in any row. You know? um, I mean, it's like, it's a really, really, um, you know, the institution as it grew out of the building, you know, the building came even before the institution, it, it was all about um, saving New York from itself in a way, you know, and it was a, a kind of self-defense, you know, to not give over this huge, enormous tract of property, less one of the last in, in Manhattan, um, just to commercial development. Yeah, you know, it is a saving grace. I mean, and, it, and you know, and it's, um, it allows it to be still New York without just being a separate little zone there. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. key. It's key. It's it's trying. It's like the David and Goliath story. It's it's uh, in this. It's small, but it's you know hopefully making you know some meaningful change there. 
but it's, least, it's, it's, it's giving the opportunity. There's the opportunity there because without that, that opportunity would be yeah. nothing, you know? Nothing. Yeah, nothing. exactly. Yeah. yeah. So it's important okay. as people are rethinking their cities and going forward and you guys as architects, Tom telling stories about urban and filmmakers that, you know, that we don't forget that that part is, you know, uh, you know, there's so many things to learn from what happened at the High Line and Lincoln Center to go forward, you know, and you guys are using that in your work. And Tom, I know you're, you know, when you did the film on Pete Aldorf, like talked about how to connect, you know, cities using landscape design and other things, you know, as ways of making the place open to all citizens, because we we're in a dangerous zone where New York could just, you know, or other places could be just um, uh, ace out so many people who would not be have opportunity to keep the city engaged. Um, I, I want to thank Tom, actually, you know, we don't have a chance to talk very much, but, you know, through your form, bringing um, the work of architects to, you know, an international audience and some of whom don't actually get to be to, in those places, get, don't get to see those places. It's, it's um, you know, I, film was always like a secret desire of mine to be a filmmaker. I never, never made it to that, but um, did a different form of, uh, uh, you know, of, of, yeah, of connecting with the public. Um, but I, I think that, you know, it's it's just an amazing thing that uh, you know to well, you know I, I feel being recorded on this film. I'm very proud to have been in this film, but it does make a, a, a wonderful difference to feel that your work as an architect is not just geofixed, that it can communicate to broader audiences that are not exactly in the spot where you where you made your mark. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, as you as you mentioned, sort of you know running into people who happen to see it on PBS, you know, I mean, I think the opportunity to and to to tell those particular stories. I mean, as you were saying, Kyle, like you know, it's when I'm making them, <clears throat> it's also a process of learning. I mean, I'm, I I don't come into it having done you know years of research and have a specific story to tell about your work, Liz, or or any other subject. Mm -hmm. It's very much about what I'm learning as I make it. And I think that hopefully is able to, to capture a certain authenticity about that moment in time as well, because I, I think there's, mm -hmm. you know, it's just sort of sharing what I'm discovering and, and, and. Yeah, but the great opportunity, what Liz is saying, the great opportunity is, you know, and what we try to do at the film festival is, so as architects and designers, we have these great conversations all the time, but what you're doing as a filmmaker is you're, and the films we like the program is allowing that conversation to be spread to a much wider audience and to be, uh, I think the successful films are the ones that relate to the whole community and not just the design community. And I think your film does that and your other films do that. And it's really, really important because at the end of the day, as architects and designers, if society understands what we do and gives, understands the value of it, it pushes us to do better work and we get to do better work and the whole place benefits, the society benefits. And so, and the film, the storytelling of architecture used to be done in books, which is a good way to do it, but film and cinematically uh, takes it to another level. And so, you know, I think the, the work you and other filmmakers do is, is also critical. Um, and it's why we started the film festival and it's why fil film my design is happening, uh, hoping to not just draw the A and D community, but to draw lawyers, plumbers, janitors, teachers, everyone. And if, and your films do that and it makes them a great success, I think, you know. Uh, well, I mean, the festivals, I mean, yours in particular, it's just, it's an incredible privilege that again, it's like something in New York where you think, oh, we can sort of take all these things for granted. But I, I, you know, you just hope people realize after seeing a film that they really enjoy, like the, the privilege of having access to it is because of efforts like yours, so I mean. So maybe this is Liz, where you get to announce that your next film you're going to be up uh, and produce <laughs> for your first film. Uh, yeah, <laughs> not yet. I, you know, I, 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 not yet, but I reserve that for uh, you know some decade, you know, okay. to come. <laughs> it will, it will challenge you, I'm sure, because like you know, even though making the act of making buildings and making films, there are some similarities. There are some differences too. <laughs> Yeah, very uh, lots and lots of similarities. It's true, and uh, yeah, but a, a skill set for which you know I have great uh, admiration and uh, 
I don't quite have it, you know, take a little learning to do it. Yeah. But they're both storytelling. I'm really, you know, yeah. you know, I mean, obviously filmmaking is clearly storytelling, but architecture really, by the choices you make as a designer and an architect, you are telling stories to everyone who uses your, 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 your projects. And, um, and I think DSNR, DSNR, you know, doing a great job telling important stories and the high lines of important story that's been uh, looked at and learned from across the world and your other projects, you know, so we, we appreciate that. And we love that you get to do projects in New York as well as that, like you said, you're not just spanning the globe, but you're still doing stuff here. So yeah. Yeah. thanks so much for your work and your time. And Tom, thanks a lot for your work and your time. Uh, and okay. looking forward to other films and other projects you guys produce. Um, Thank you, Kyle. So, it was a pleasure. Pleasure to talk to you. Great, great, great to have you guys here. Thanks so much. Appreciate you taking time this morning. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Bye, all. guys. Take okay, bye-bye.